This is topic 5.2, terrestrial food production systems. So in topic 5.1, we talked about what soil is and what makes good soil. Loam would be the best type of soil. Now that we've got good soil, how could you go ahead and design a production system? And if you're having access to really good soil, makes it easy, but unfortunately in many parts of the world, climate conditions and so forth, you have soil systems which are not optimal. And so you need to tailor your production system to the conditions that you live in. So let's take a look at this. The goal, of course, is to have a sustainable food production. We want to have a diet and an amount of food that can handle an increase in population. And as the population keeps increasing, there's more and more pressure to modify your food production system. In the United States, this gave rise, of course, to agribusiness. And agribusiness is a significant shift from traditional single-family farming in the United States. Used to be 50% or so of the United States population was involved in farming. Now, one, maybe 2% at the most. What do we see as a shift in their model? Well, from raising all sorts of food production, we have monocultures. Typically, you'll see huge fields just dedicated to corn or one single type of crop. And this has lots of problems for making sustainable land use. This also causes, therefore, the overproduction of fertilizer use since you're not getting all the minerals uh, being put back into the soil. A heavy reliance on technology and exportation. And it becomes a, 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 a crop which is, has a monetary value to it. And so we don't um, rely so much on weather conditions. And um, we don't rely so much on um, domestic concerns because we can export it. This, of course, increases our carbon footprint and other problems come along with that, as well as importation of food. What we've seen because of our massive food production system in the United States, uh, overuse of water. And it's very interesting that um, most water used for farms, it's not like it's coming through a, a tap line, like you and I would get water in our houses. It's probably being pumped up somehow from the ground, which means it has a high salt concentration. And so we increase salinization of the land by spraying this water all over. We also because of the overuse of fertilizers, have a problem of eutrophication, that is, algae blooms. Other indirect problems of fertilizers, they tend to cause the death of bees. There is a real problem with uh, bee populations in the United States right now. Nobody knows exactly what's causing it. This may be part of it. And of course, the overuse of antibiotics because you're trying to increase food production. On the one hand, that's good, but on the other hand, you're probably creating, creating resistant bacteria, which then get into the general population, and that's a bad thing. Unfortunately, if you look at the world, especially the difference between LEDCs and MEDCs, we're seeing a real inequality with food production systems. As I said, in the United States, we have an incredible food production system. 1% of the population is easily able to produce more than enough food for the 336 million people in the United States here. Therefore, we can easily export. We also have the money to easily import foods that we like. I particularly like to have grapes all year round. And uh, in wintertime, I can get those grapes because they're imported from uh, Chile. Unfortunately, you have some countries which rely on food exportation as a cash crop. And therefore, even though they're producing lots of food, it doesn't get used by the local population because they need it to generate income for their economies. Countries also have problems with less land being available. Not everywhere is Iowa or the Ukraine. Most places in the world, very difficult to grow food. We have climate issues, harder to grow food in desert, hot, sunny climates, for example. 
And so we have competition then uh, for resources to maintain food production systems. Unfortunately, right now, even though we can easily produce enough food to feed the world, a significant part of the world is going hungry. One-sixth of the world goes to bed hungry every night. Three-quarters of the world probably doesn't get an adequate diet, even though we can easily produce enough food. So there are implicit systems which are causing the problems. So what's one of the problems? Well, let's stick here with the United States. Incredible amount of food waste. So I don't know if you've ever noticed when you go to the supermarket, the produce section, and you see the bin of apples, they're all beautiful. They're all shiny and the same size and no holes and no marks on them. They just look great. And you have this impression that what's going on is that Wow, this farmer really knows what he or she is doing. They know how to grow perfect fruit all the time. Well, they don't know how to grow perfect fruit. What's going on is that the imperfect fruit is being removed from the bin, thrown away, and only the good stuff, perfect stuff, is being delivered to the store. And this could be 50% of the produce that's actually being thrown away. Now, there's nothing wrong with the produce. Uh, as far as nutritional value, it's just fine. It just doesn't look aesthetically pleasing to us. Expiration dates are the same way. I heard once that expiration dates are probably exaggerated by twofold. In other words, if they tell you you should throw it away in a month, it's probably still good at two months. But we're just not used to that. Inadequate transfer, we don't move things around very well. And we overconsume some things and that causes shortages also. So we have massive inequality between LEDCs and MEDCs. LEDCs, inefficient farming. They don't have the technology. They have diseases. They have transportation problems. And at MEDCs, we have problems at the consumer end. We're just picky. Our quality standards, our demand for certain things is just different. Different sets of problems. So, based on your social system, based on your location, geographical location, climate conditions, and your technology available, what sort of production system would you as a country choose? And part of it does affect our EVS. We might want something which is ecocentric. We might want something in the United States, for example, that is very technocentric. So before you decide what type of food production system you want, ask yourself the following question. Why am I farming? Am I farming to feed my family or am I farming for profit? Next question, am I farming just for domestic use or is this something I want to export? Am I farming for quantity or do I want quality here? Am I farming because this is a business or is this some sort of lifestyle that I'm trying to maintain? There are obviously other questions. Let's take a look at a couple of case studies about how if you ask yourself these questions and others, what sort of food production system you might have. First case study, let's look at the Amazon. They have got what we call a shifting cultivation system or what's commonly called slash and burn. So you have a huge rainforest. What they've done is decided to just clear cut it, use it to grow whatever crops or raise whatever livestock they want, and then they just move on. And the idea is that the rainforest has so much momentum in it, it's such a strong biome, that the forest will simply reclaim the area. So you move on, and by the time you get back to it, it's replenished itself. Totally different system. Let's look at Southeast Asia. They have a very hot, wet, sunny climate down there, very tropical. So they have decided to have a system which is based on wet rice. And you've seen the patties and so forth. This is a high labor, low technology solution, but it works in their environment. What would be the constraints then? Not just the things we want, but what would limit us? Well, one thing, of course, is the availability of land. So if you're in the United States, out in the Midwest, 
Lots of land and good arable land is available. If you're in uh, South America, where it's very mountainous, very difficult to do farming that requires flat, open land. And you want to talk about efficiency. What would be the most efficient system you could have? Do you have the technology? Do you have the resources? So in the United States, for example, we are able to grow livestock, cattle, for example, because we have the resources to back it up. It's interesting to think that most countries don't really raise cattle. There's actually only a few countries in the world that grow significant, not grow, but raise significant uh, cattle populations. The United States, Canada, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, but not many others. Let's go back to what we talked about in Unit 1. How would we therefore model a system? Inputs and storage and output. And the arrows indicate flows here. So if we were talking about beef production, we want to have a cattle farm, right? Obviously, you'd put in things like the food for the cattle, antibiotics, labor. They don't all have to be physical things for the inputs. You're going to get out beef and waste. And of course, your storage are the cattle themselves. What type of farming types could we have? So let's talk about commercial farming and subsistent farming. So commercial farming is pretty much what's going on in the United States. There is a massive decrease in the number of single family farms or substance farming because we've moved into a high technology solution and it's one basically for profit. So the inputs and outputs would really be different for commercial farming versus subsistence farming. What's the impact of this switch? Well, we have more problems then. So we have more erosion. I mean, as we're ramping up the system, right? The flows are moving too fast. Erosion, creation of deserts, salinity, pollution, disease, habitat lot, eutrophication, huge problems. So in other words, we have ramped up the system to create a food production system that really gives us a lot of output. But is it sustainable? Probably not. What can we do about that if it's not sustainable? Well, we can alter the flows, can't we? We could start to move to more of a vegetarian diet, eat less meat, probably a good idea. We could move to more organics and local foods. For example, there is a restaurant, Burgerville here, which really prides itself on using local in-season foods. We could have buffer zones, not just mow down the area, but separate it into areas which are used for food and not, and so that you have a flow of nutrients that go back in there. And you could, of course, increase monitoring standards, which in the United States are not particularly good right now. And that concludes our discussion on food production.